Uh, good morning, everyone. This is the July 15th meeting of the elementary school building committee. And seeing that we have a quorum, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 831. And my first order of business is to make sure everyone can hear and be heard. So I just wanted to let people know that the legislature has voted but it has to go to the governor um, to allow us to continue to meet by Zoom if we want to continue. But we're in this one day limbo land where our town attorney determined that because we posted it on Tuesday, we can't, we didn't have time to tell the public that they would have had to come in person under our old rules to, to a phys physical site so that we could conduct this meeting virtually as we are now doing. So I will do as we've done in the past, just making sure everyone can hear and be heard by calling out the names of the committee members. Uh, Paul. Here. Uh, Tammy. Here. Sean. Here. Ben. You uh, unmute again, Ben. Just let make sure we can hear you. We're not hearing you. Yeah. I'll go to the next one, Rupert. Allison. I'm here. Great. Jonathan. Here. Phoebe. Hello. Hi. And Ben, let's see if you've got your audio set up. I think I fixed it. Yeah, fix it. you did. And Rupert, I didn't hear Rupert respond. So I'm seeing, Sean, I think uh, Mary Balso is um, raising her hand and she she is from Answer. And Margaret, you wanted to bring her into the meeting, is that correct? Yes, and also Bob Stevens should be with us. I see okay. Bob. Okay. And there's Mary. Great. Okay, so we want we have one more committee member who said she would be here virtually, um, and that is uh, Alicia. So when she appears, I'll call on her. But I am going to turn the meeting over to Answer, who will introduce what we're doing today. And uh, we have two people that are joining us. So Margaret, it's you're on. Okay. So um, just briefly, I, I know you all have met Bob before, who is always backing me up, but I also wanted to introduce Mary Bolso, who is gonna be actually in my role, um, leading the project when we're in construction. Um, Mary is a longtime um, partner in crime and uh, lives in... I live in... Mary, Mary why don't you say a few words by yourself? <laughs> Yeah, I live in Central Mass and I'm currently working out that way in another project, so it's convenient and timing. Um, I've been an owner's project manager for over 10 years. Before that, I was, I've was always been in the trade, so looking forward to this. So what I'm gonna do is just quickly put up the agenda and then we'll move on. So here, can everybody see that? Or can someone see it? Yeah, I can see it, so. Okay, so. The first thing we're going to look at is uh, design target dates, which Danisco has developed. Uh, Kathy set them out, I think, with the agenda, um, but I'll pull them up. Um, and um, the meeting schedule. We're, and then most of the meeting is going to be uh, devoted to a discussion of the decision that the committee needs to make between design, bid, build, and construction manager at risk as a method of project delivery. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about dates for school visits. And if we have time, we're gonna talk about the, uh, what Danisco is recommending for the sustainability rating system for the project. And we uh, have one invoice to look at at the end. So I'm gonna take that down and I'm gonna pull up the meeting list. There's so many things up in my desktop. Here we go. I'll make this a little bigger. 
So um, Donna and Tim, do you want to, and Rick, I think is here as well. Do you want to walk us through this? Sure, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Sure. Um, this list uh, is, is basically the milestones of decisions that we have to hit, um, you know, to get to where we want to be uh, in November when we're putting the pricing set together. Uh, so we're looking at big picture items first, overall site plan, um, the mechanical system, uh, you know, in general, air source first, ground source. Um, and then uh, toward the front end, we're doing a lot of scheduling, uh, making sure that the plan is working. Um, and then we get into a finer grain of detail um, with particular meetings. Um, that being said, just as an overall, this is milestones, broad brush. We'd like to have a, a little bit of a discussion about how we achieve these. These are all currently um, scheduled as full committee meetings every two weeks. Um, and this is a lot to get through um, in large full building committee meetings. So there's um, a discussion that has to be had about a working group or smaller affinity groups and what the composition and schedule for those meetings would be, um, particularly for design, um, various aspects of design, um, obviously plan layout will be discussed primarily and initially with Mike and the school department, uh, but there may be people on the committee or even members who aren't necessarily on the committee that have an affinity for exterior design, um, daylighting, various aspects of the project. So we have to have a discussion of how we set those mm -hmm. groups up and what the parameters are and how they can meet and how we can move through this. So um, I just scrolled down to the end because mm -hmm. one of the challenges of doing a project that starts in the summer where it seems like it's forever until you get finished is remembering that you're sort of trying to wrap up the project through the holidays. So you can see here, um, I think a really important milestone to be aware of is that the cost estimating is proposed to be done by the end of October. And then we're sort of, actually the documents that are going to the cost estimators. The estimators are working in November on the estimates and then the committee sees them in early December. And then the schematic design submission we're tentatively saying is mid no mid December. We actually don't know what the sub, the MSBA submittal date is because they have not yet published their January meeting calendar, um, but this is, I think, a good educated guess. And then um, there would be a vote in early January to submit the schematic design. So those end dates are a little subject to change based on the MSBA's calendar, but that's kind of the overall arc of the process. Does anybody have any questions about that? Don? Uh, Sean, uh, Sean's hands is up. Yeah, Sean. so um, a couple of questions. Um, I didn't see on there when we'll actually decide on the construction delivery option. Is that, um, when so would that happen? That's a great question. Um, we, we could, you could decide today um, based on the presentation. Um, I think it would be a good idea at the latest to decide at the next meeting. Okay, I think we were gonna not do anything major today because of the the, the limbo period we're in. Um, yeah. And then a couple other questions. Um, when, when will we have a good sort of estimate of the town share that we feel uh, comfortable sharing? Um, I see the vote in December um, or the cost estimate in December. And I think the council's thinking about their vote being in December. Um, but we're going to need to have information ahead of time prior to that to share with the public and to um, do the outreach and all that. So what date do you think is the earliest we would have that? So um, I would say um, I've actually done a draft of it. I haven't uh, shared it yet. It needs to be updated with um, the design bid build numbers. The, the estimates were based, as you all might remember, 
on CM, so I will need to update them with design bid build numbers if we go in that direction. But as you know, I could do that now. I just need to go back to uh, Pete, Timothy, um, Denisco team. I'll need to go back to them and kind of get because I think he's ba he based his uh, direct labor numbers on the CM option and then calculated as a lump sum mm -hmm. what the savings would be. So that's with that with that piece of data. Yeah, maybe I after we, something. if we vote at the next meeting on the delivery option, then I don't want to rush it. I'm just saying, I think yeah. if, we, if we have a few months before that vote, that would be great. Um, yeah. and, and then the last thing is, so, um, you know, if we want to discuss ways to, based on cost estimates or based on um, the information from the designer, if we want to discuss ways to potentially reduce the overall cost of the project um, in terms of maybe bid alternates or things like that, that we would go forward with, when would that type of discussion happen? I'm going to ask the Danisco team for their thoughts about that. And, and I bring it up because we're having a similar discussion yep. with our with our library project right now. We're, um, everyone knows, you know, construction costs are really high um, with inflation and everything going on. And so, you know, I, I think it's a good conversation for us to have at some point. Is just, um, you know, are there ways where we can you know, decisions we can make, or we can at least give ourselves the option um, when we get the bids to, to reduce costs. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of the conversation as we refine the design, those conversations will come up, right? So some of it could be um, discussed as materials are selected, as um, the design um, kind of develops. So those, we don't like to say, here is your product and oh, by the way, here are ways to do it. We can look at options as we go through it, Sean, and then identify what's most important, kind of do, you know, a list of, I, we don't like alternates is a better word than value engineering. And then the other consideration is, okay, how does this impact the design, right? So, we'll say, okay, well, this we can do and carry an alternate until bid day. And this, we really need to make a decision before that date because it impacts X, Y, Z. But we'll, we'll have those conversations with you throughout schematic design. Um, you okay. know, can I, can I also just add um, this, this may seem counterintuitive, but um, I think that you you want to really nail the scope of the project for the schematic design process. Um, the project has a long way to go after schematic design in ways that impact the cost of the project. So I just want to make sure everybody understands, like when we get to the end of schematic design and we're submitting this, the submission is about getting to an agreement about cost with the MSBA, right? And to have a number on which to base a debt exclusion. It does not mean that the process of looking for cost savings is gonna stop. And I will also say the market's been so volatile. I think there's gonna be an ongoing discussion about you know, like something that is gonna be a price X in December could be higher or lower six or eight months later. So it, I just want to make sure everybody understands that when we get to the end of schematic design, we're not done with that conversation. You should think of the schematic design piece as setting the basis of the funding agreement. Um, okay, so I see Kathy's hands up, uh, hand up. I, I I wanted, I'm going to do a follow up on Sean's, but also link it to this notion of working groups that uh, Tim just did. Um, as I understand uh, the process, the um, Mike was going to identify within the school staff, Tammy, Allison, and whomever. So we're at a point of saying, what do these rooms really look like? What does the inside of the building look like? What does the outside of the building look like? You know, making some choices, all of which, um, has to do with both the look and feel of the building, but also the cost of the building um, and, and materials decisions. And we're gonna be doing 
three site visits, um, which will let us look at some schools that have been built recently. And I've started, I don't know how many other people are doing it. It's like this, an obsession with this project, but I walk around Amherst College and I've started taking pictures because they've, they've done a bunch of new buildings recently and going, this one is different from that and try to figure out, is that metal on the outside? Is that brick? What is it? you know, on the outside of the building, and I hate it, I like it, um, but trying to just think through, we have a lot of choices. So my, my question with that is, um, if some but not all of the committee, as we are, and I want to make sure Alicia's here, so I want to make sure she can hear, she has joined us, Margaret, for your notes later. Thank you. But um, if some but not all of us want to be, um, either a fly on the wall as those discussions are happening because we don't know enough on a, what does the art room look like or the music room, you know, on placement and, and refinement um, or active. And, and we want to involve more of the people who work in the buildings, the staff. Um, when do we have to do what to, um, if it's just school staff working with Mike, we don't have to formally set up a meeting. Um, if we try to do something that's a voting group, we have to set it up more officially. So that's, I just want to, because it seems to me it needs to start now, July and August and September by that schedule is when all of this, these kinds of decisions will be made. So that I just wanted to sense Tim and, and Donna, and I'm thinking that means you come out to Amherst and, you know, are literally like this I'll stop talking, but it shows my layperson, Jonathan, for the architect. This is what this kind of brick would look like. You don't have to do this kind of brick. You could do that for the outside of the building, um, you know, and we'll get into windows and daylighting and and other kinds of things. But when when are you going to be wanting an active group to meet with to go through those decisions? Well, I mean, some of the things that you just mentioned, like this brick versus that brick is a couple of meetings down the road, but the very, within two weeks, we are going to start moving pieces around on the site and look, be looking for guidance, talking about manipulations of the plan, entrance and exits, big picture moves in terms of the plan, site plan, and we'll want way in. So, I mean, honestly, as soon as we can schedule it, if it, if it was around or instead of, or on the same day as the meeting of the 29th, we will have a lot to talk about and we need to get moving. And and Donna, just on that, have you, Mike was not able to be with us today, but have you been in contact with Mike and trying to set something up with uh, where, or Tammy and Allison, you know, where, where people are that, and Rupert and Ben, you know, where people are this summer, you know, to see uh, getting people in a room together. Um, have you, is that- Yeah, we, we, we haven't. Um, I think Mike was away. I, I'm not sure, but I mean, we can certainly take a poll and make sure that he has his team. I, I think Ben would definitely, or or uh, Rupert would definitely also want to be involved too, because they they have a big role right. in this as well. But um, we recognize this is probably the worst time of year, um, truly, to, to try to move this forward. So we can reach out to him and, and make sure. I think he's hopefully given some thought on who he would like involved. We're actually, the very, not to get into the weeds here, but the, one of the very first tasks, which will be important, is to organize the classrooms or the spaces, all the rooms in the building. And so we really would look to the experts that are in those spaces. Um, and now you have two schools, right, merging. So I, we just have to figure out, for example, art, right? Um, bringing those art teachers into the room together. And even if it's just for 50, or an hour to talk about just specifically their area of expertise. Um, and then there would be other spaces that we would want away. Special ed will be an important consideration because they have many spaces, um, PE, outdoor learning, all of that. So 
we'll we'll put a list together for Mike and then make sure we can do that, you know, and get it to him early next week so he can see who we're looking to bring to the table, if that would be helpful. Um, we've been talking about it and obviously the principals would be great too. And then with the committee, um, you've mentioned there's a, a large share of the people you've mentioned on our committee, but, I know. We, have, but we also have others on the committee. So to the extent um, others of us wanted to be at least hearing those discussions, would you show us the schedule of when you're meeting, talking about what, um, and then for, uh, and, and Paul had said earlier that if we try to set up anything as a working group um, that isn't just advising and working with the superintendent, then we need to post it. We had, need to, do, am I right, Paul, that we, there need to be appointments to it? So even if we're just saying it's ad hoc and that it's just for this three month time period, we would have to set something up. So that's what I'm looking for, a way to, to, to be, to allow participation um, and, and, and you don't, the meetings with Mike and staff don't have to be posted publicly with Zoom or whatever. Um, we could make, and we could bring the materials back to the committee each yeah. time, you know, yeah. so it would be public. So I'm, I'm just looking for you all to give us that kind of schedule um, so that, uh, and, and you know, exterior of the building, uh, there, there's going to be a lot of interest on daylighting, on, you know, the uh, sustainability materials, but also just the, um, the, uh, the, we've already started having them, you, you've told us amount of insulation in the building and what's on the outside of the building, um, to the extent that helps with heat retention or um, keeping heat out of the building in the summertime. So that's what I was seeing at Amherst College. They had these like little shelves around the windows that I think were to prevent gl glare. Um, so, so there may be some of us that are more able to think through that than the inside of the building. So just right. if, we, if we had some schedule to react to, um, and I'll stop talking because I'm seeing Jonathan's nodding his head periodically. So just on a when and how the full committee, those of us who want to engage and Rupert's up. I'm, yeah, I'm just I think, talking. yeah, no, no, you're right, Kathy. And I think as far as Mike and his team um, and, and their input as to reconfirming the layout of the building and then what their spaces um, are gonna look like or be designed to, that's one conversation. The, the all, everything you just said about the exterior, the windows, the daylighting, the insulation, those are probably more for different subgroups than, than for Mike and his team, right? So the look of the building, really, it would be great to get a team that is interested in the exterior design, right? Maybe, maybe there's some people that are more interested in the exterior design and leaving it to the occupants for the interior design or something. Um, the net zero group, there may be people on that net zero subcommittee that may want to weigh in on the insulation and, and that type of thing, daylighting. So we'll, we'll articulate you know, the types of conversations. And I think you will have hopefully a wide range of topics that different people can pick and choose what's important to them or what they're experts in or. So I'm gonna, Rupert's hand is up. So one question would be if we, we called it the net zero subcommittee, if we called it the sustainability, just yeah, yeah, tweak yeah. its name. And it's a subgroup of ours, Paul. If we said we wanna expand that, we could, we made we voted to set that up. Paul, we can set that up if it's a subgroup of us, correct? You know, so if others who aren't on that now would like to be part of it, you know, they can we can do that on the 29th when we meet again two weeks yeah. from now to make that committee be this committee is now 
we can call it the exterior of the building to whatever we need. Right. It's, it's a subgroup of this committee, correct, Paul? I'm just looking. Paul's not. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's true. And, and so this this body can create subcommittees and other, you know, you know, like the Jones Library has an outreach subcommittee. They have a design subcommittee. There's different subcommittees. So this group can, has already done the um, sustainability subgroup. So we could have a different subgroup that looks at different aspects of it as well. Yeah, that's, that's well, great. Paul, we couldn't have formally have someone who's not on the committee on it. No, it should, it should be a sub -kit, subset of this group. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And those meetings need to be posted and then yeah. the meeting minutes. Correct, so correct. For every, for every additional subcommittee you make, there's, there's administrative work that goes with it. Well, so Margaret, what I was thinking is we could expand the title of the subcommittee we have if it's the ex since the exterior of the building is partly about sustainability. Um, no, you know, I, 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 I totally agree with that strategy. Okay. Okay, Rupert, sorry to, to talk so long. There, now I'm unmuted. Um, you no, know, that's fine. It's all, it's all important. Um, I'm concerned that we're not, uh, I'm not seeing uh, space and time in the schedule to try to deal with uh, what I think is the, the thorniest issue, which is the transportation and, and traffic and site access. Uh, and I'm very concerned that we're gonna just sort of ignore that until it's too late uh, to make any meaningful improvements or changes because the rest of the design will proceed without it. I, I think it would be irresponsible for us or for anyone for that matter uh, to suggest that those issues will resolve themselves or that we can just ignore them. I think they're extremely important for safety. I think uh, some of the impacts, for example, if it takes a very long time for school buses to get into and out of the, uh, the school building site, uh, that will have an impact on scheduling for the middle and high school because of the way the bus runs work. All of these things need to be considered and uh, I urge us to try to resolve these as soon as possible. Yep, so we're, we're in agreement. Yep, we, we actually, that is, again, another conversation that can occur simultaneously. And, and we're, we fully support everything you just said, Rupert. So I think we would need to work with Paul and Sean because some of that is, it's off, off site, right? And, and how we address that, but we're ready to, get going on that as well. So again, is that another subgroup, Paul and Sean, or is that something the town wants to help us navigate? I don't think it would be a subgroup. I think it would, you know, we'd clearly want the town engineer to be part and parcel to this conversation along with Rupert, who's going to have you know, the expertise from inside the site. And then we have the, and I think just working through the staff level and then bring to, to this committee sort of what some options are working with the designers as well. So I think what Rupert is asking is uh, the, when we looked at the list of the agenda, the word traffic wasn't on it. And mm -hmm. I, and Rupert, it was tentatively on it for today, but I knew that the discussion with Paul hadn't happened yet. So I think we need to put it on the agenda so that it's, whether it's the 29th or that first meeting in August, we have a target date, Paul, so that the discussions have happened and you can bring it to the committee. Um, yeah, it, so it would definitely I can talk to you afterwards on what what is feasible. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. I just just to set and manage expectations. I think um, that to bring something forward to the committee, um, to, uh, we would not be prepared by July 29th to bring right. anything. But but it it will occur simultaneously to all these other conversations because we need to understand how the traffic informs the site flow and everything else. So, so they are part and parcel to all of this. And it could just be updates too, right? So if we don't have a recommendation, we can say we've been working on this and we're looking at two options just, just to keep everyone informed. Um, I don't think, I think a lot of these subgroups or sub conversations are going to be pretty fluid and we're going to want to study them for one to two months we don't want to rush but we can be reporting back and saying this is what you know we've achieved and this is the direction we're going is everyone good without having to make a final decision in two weeks 
Okay, so we we can have we can try to do that behind this, you know, with Paul Rupert, and then figure out what what the data is. Any options and discussion can be brought back to the committee. Yep. And, and maybe what I. Happy. Maybe what I can do is I can take the initiative to organize that on our end and then get back to you, Kathy, on timing. Any other, Donna, your hand was up. Was that? Yeah, it was. It was just, just going back to, I, I don't know if it was Rupert or Ben, um, regarding, or I think it was Sean, re regarding the al alternates. MSBA does require at schematic design and also at every other submission to have a list of what they call value engineering. And so it really is sort of our alternate list to say, okay, have you thought about, we want you to continue to have a list of what they call value engineering, which is maybe a selection of a particular item that might cost less, or you might, it might be a process of something that you may do differently um, that may influence the cost. And so MSBA wants us to keep this running tally, um, usually because as you know, the market you know, may spike or go down that you have alternatives to consider as, as you work through the design, as Margaret said. So I hate to use the word value engineering because that's such a negative connotation, but uh, we will keep this running tally yeah. throughout the design process. And, yeah. and it will be part of this mission and everyone will, will get to weigh in on it, right? So instead of uh, panels on the exterior, we're going to use more ground face CMU or something because it's less expensive or whatever. So we'll, we'll have options for those. Okay, I'm watching the time. Okay, anything else on this topic? No, and, and from what we know, just everyone should know is uh, the, we got word that the legislature has allowed Zoom meetings to continue. Um, so we will be able to continue to use this option if, unless we want to meet in person at some point. So um, I'm turning it, I think the next is you, Margaret, is that correct? Yeah. All right. So we're going to toggle to this discussion of design, bid, build versus CM at risk. So um, I sent the slides out last night. Um, if you need to look at them, they you know they should be in your inbox. Um, I this is a it's a con, this is a complex issue, but um, I think you know the the bottom line just before we get started is that there's there's a, a general perception that um, design bid build is less expensive than construction management at risk for a bunch of reasons that we're going to discuss in this, and there are a lot of different opinions in the room about this. Um, but I think generally the numbers bear out that that's the case. And I know that the cost of the project is a hot topic here. What I'm gonna try to sort of outline in this process is that there are, there are some risks associated with this project that we need to manage. So design bid build works well for, you know, really straightforward, simple projects. It's a, it's a bad idea if you're, you know, doing some of the other options we looked at where you're doing an ad reno, you really want to have a construction manager. Um, but there, so there's much to recommend design bid build for this project because the way Danisco has approached this, we essentially have a construction site next to an operating school, but there's a, you know, there's a dividing line between them. The complexity here really comes around the net zero piece and the ground source. Uh, and the geothermal system and its integration with the building. So with that being said, I'm gonna share this. I'm gonna um, go through a couple of, couple of slides at a time and then check and see if hands are up. So hang on one second, I'm having trouble sharing this. Sorry, I've lost the screen that's gonna let me share. So it's just gonna take me a minute to figure this out. Oh, 
sorry, I've lost my share button. So I'm going <laughs> to. Margaret, do you, do you want, I've got it available to share if you want yeah, to click I through it. Yeah, I could do it too. Well, uh, yeah, there's, this is why I'm still, I'm still a bit of a, a yeah, why don't you pull it up, Sean? Um, I, go, go ahead, Kathy, and do it. No, if you've got it, Sean, do it because okay. I'll have to exit. I don't have it open as a screen. Is that um, large enough? Yeah, that's totally fine. Okay. I've got it um, at, a, at a bigger scale on my screen. So let's go to the next, uh, the next slide. So, you know, just in terms of the lingo, so in Massachusetts, there's two ways to do what they call project delivery. One is 149, which is also called design bid build, and one is 149A. Um, as a reminder, um, when we did the PSR estimates, the estimates for um, design bid build was a little over 97 million for um, design bid build and about 106 million for uh, CM at risk. Now, you know, there's both of our estimators who worked on this are folks who came out of the design bid build background and they, I think, have a bit of a bias towards design bid build. But in the following slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the, the real differences there are. So Sean, how about the next slide then? Margaret, I just want to confirm those numbers. Those were project costs, correct? Those are the project costs. Yes, yeah. right. exactly. So, um, so to understand what's in the mix here, um, there's three components here, and which are represented by the color. So, I took to do this chart. I took the Fort River estimate. Um, uh, Pete Timothy's estimate. And I took all of the what's called filed subbids, which are the orange, which are actually bid independent of either a general contractor or a CM at risk. Um, the blue is what's called trade bids, which are bid in the case of a, G, a general contractor, they're bid directly to the general contractor. Um, and actually, in either case, bid directly to the contractor. And then the 11% is the cost of um, the general contractor, uh, or in this case, it was using the CM. So next slide. So um, there are, um, this is just a little bit of an explanation of you know, what the difference is. So with design bid build, you're essentially putting the thing out to bid and you are uh, getting back um, a cost. So it's a sort of single moment in time. The way it works is you actually bid the filed sub bids first and then the general contractor uh, provides a bid for the entire project folding in the appropriate filed sub bids. Next slide. So in a CM at risk, you're actually hiring someone to work with the project team um, we definitely recommend, and I know Danisco agrees that it be part of part, be part of schematic design um, because they then they really have ownership of what has gone to the MSBA and what is the basis of the funding agreement. Next slide. So um, there's a lot of things people disagree with about this, but I, I tried to list here what is an agreement. So it's the traditional. Chapter 149, Design Bid Build, is the tr traditional method of building a project. Um, the builder's called a general contractor. It's design is finished, then bid. Filed sub bids come first, and then the bid for the entire project. The selection is bid or price based. The contract value is called a lump sum. And the contract is what's called a closed book because the contractor doesn't share information about the bids with um, the owner. Next slide. Construction management at risk. Um, the builder is called a construction manager. The selection is qualifications and cost base. You actually, to do this, you set up a committee, uh, would be a subset of this committee to select the CM and you first advertise and take in qualifications and then you shortlist uh, three to five firms typically to 
bid on their general conditions. If you think back to the, the pie chart, to bid on the gray part of the cost. Uh, CM participates in pre-qualifying subcontractors. They would be pre-qualified in any case, but they're a participant in that process. Um, it's a little easier to do early bid packages to that are um, and to integrate them. The contract is called when you sign the contract. It's what's called a guaranteed maximum price, and it is an open book. So you see uh, not what's in the filed subbids, but the general contractor's costs as well as the trade bid costs are sort of viewed by the owner and there's an opportunity to comment on them and be engaged in that. Next slide. So um, these are the things that are usually taken into consideration when making this decision. How complicated it is, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, the complexity here is definitely around the um, net zero piece. But budget design bid build is generally considered cheaper. Construction quality, this is important to understand that the general contractor who is a low bidder will provide typically less oversight during construction than a CM because it's really, it's part of how they are getting to the most competitive cost. Um, schedule, there is, as I mentioned, a little bit more flexibility for early packages, but it's not impossible to do early packages with design bid build. In fact, I think Danisco has quite a bit of experience with this. Um, the risk is tied to the complexity. So it's kind of about the net zero. Owner's expertise, Des design bid build is just much more straightforward to administer. Um, and the owner's level of effort, if you're gonna do a construction management project, you do need to set up a committee that allows you to uh, do the procurement of the construction manager. And that, does, that process does take about three months typically. So next slide. Um, pros and cons, this is starting to be a little bit repetitive of the earlier slides, but the pro of design bid build is it's definitely simpler. Um, and it does typically produce a lower base contract cost. Um, the cons are it's more linear, so you can't, it's hard to do, for instance, um, really complicated early packages using this process. If it's over the estimate, it may require you to rebid it. Um, there is an increased likelihood, maybe probability is not the right word of disputes and claims. It, it definitely puts more pressure on the designer to have a really tight set of documents. Um, and I know Danisco's good at that. Um, there's no builder input on the design and the full cost tends to not be realized till completion when you see what the change orders were. Next slide. Um, these are the pros and cons of construction management. Again, this is getting a bit repetitive, um, but I thought it was good to summarize them. Um, why don't we go to the next slide, uh, which is about finding the tipping point. So there's several slides here that um, this one and the next one, I actually pulled from an Associated General Contractor um, presentation. Now the AGC, they are big proponents of CM at risk. Many of their members are uh, contractors who uh, like to do CM at risk. So I always look at what they're presenting um, for bias. But I think these two statements are correct. And that it's a kind of, you know, finding the tipping point and evaluating your project. There's no perfect way to do this. The next slide, which is, again, it's an AGC slide um, and it has, uh, you know, again, perhaps some bias put into it does, I, I think as a diagram does explain, you know, really well how these numbers are different. 
And for instance, I want to really focus on this purple piece in the middle. Um, you know, one of the biggest differences here is that um, the non, so the filed subbids you can imagine are basically, they get, they get bid the same. Those numbers are probably going to be relatively similar, whether it's a CM project or a design bid build project. But on this, in this purple zone, the non-trade contractors, um, and, and they're, I went by the slide a little fast. They're, they're big numbers in the project, but probably only about 30% of the cost in total. It's concrete, it's steel, it's site work. Um, those get bid, when a general contractor situation, they get bid directly to the general contractor and the CM to the CM, but they're, it's open book, so the owner gets to see them. And there's, I think, no question that um, there is, there tends to be a difference there in terms of cost, that in the less competitive CM world, where the CMs are, have a bit of more of an opportunity to pick, uh, you know, who they're using, those numbers tend to be bigger. Um, and then on the trade bids, um, I think uh, these numbers are, you know, pretty close. The CM project has embedded in the contract what's called a CM contingency, which is, uh, can only be used with owner approval. Um, and that is um, then outside of that, in either case, there's a change order number that is controlled by the owner. So, you know, the, the question mark is because uh, there's always a, uh, what would I call it? A discretionary, the, the use of the CM contingency is discretionary to the owner and the change orders are really, you know, subject to a lot of discussion and also sometimes not necessarily agreement. Um, and so this is the piece that you, know, you spend, you really want to keep this number down during construction, um, but it is, can be mitigated in the CM piece, CM side by uh, the use of CM contingency. So next slide. Um, just to, sorry, I'm going through these slides all at once without stopping because I can't actually see you all right now, um, but we'll stop at the end and look at these. I, I put in here at the end, just a reminder about, uh, for instance, how Wildwood, the Wildwood project, which, which did propose to use a CM and a CM was selected for the project, how, what that project looked like. And you can see it was, you know, it was really a different project. It wasn't, for instance, net zero, it wasn't three stories. It had a pretty big footprint. And what they did was they basically built the new building right next to the existing building and then demolish the building um, as they went. Um, and that overall duration was a little under three years. And on the next slide, Sean, if you can go to that, this is our project where you can see, you know, because of the larger site, there's just more ability for the construction and the, um, school to operate in parallel. And, at, you know, as you all know, it was that was a key issue in the choice of this option. Next slide. So um, I think I want to actually come back to this and go to the next slide. I, I thought it would be helpful to talk a little bit about, or for you all to see at least, what's going on now. So I, yesterday I took all the current projects, so not the projects, the MSBA projects that have been closed out, but the ones that are still kind of on their books as open projects. And I made a list of them. So on the left are the design bid build projects and on the right are the CM projects. You know, I think what's interesting about this list is you can see there's very little overlap between who is doing the CM projects, which is in the column on the far right, and the design bid build project. So one 
point of overlap is Fontaine Brothers, who um, were actually the selected CM for the Wildwood Project. And they actually operate in both, uh, both project types and um, are very likely to be interested in this project, right, you know, regardless, whatever. But the design bid build, it's a smaller list of contractors. Um, there has not been a net zero project done as design bid build as, at this time, which is probably gonna change. And the other thing I think that's really interesting is that if you look at the design bid build a list of contractors, there are a whole bunch of TBDs. So what that means is those are projects in early stages where they have decided they're going design bid build, but they have not yet selected. And I think that's really interesting because it suggests that there is a trend right now towards design bid build in the entire MSBA portfolio of projects. So again, I'm struggling with trying to get my screen to be the right size. And I think I'm gonna, what I'm actually gonna do is leave the meeting and come back in because I just cannot seem to get the screen to be bigger. But um, let, me, let me do that and I'll be right back, okay? Um, Jonathan, you want to ask a question? Go, what, or well, comment? I just wanted to note that, that unfortunately, and I'm glad we're not making a decision today. Unfortunately, uh, I have a, a, a hard stop in about uh, 10 or 15 uh, minutes um, because I have a, a work obligation. I could not move. So. so why don't you, since you have to leave, do you, um, as Margaret is trying to pull back up her screen, um, do you want to make any comments from your perspective? Sure on this um, so that we don't miss that. Yeah. Well, I think Margaret was just kind of getting to the that point it, to kind of understand what the trend is at the moment. Um, you know, certainly when when I would expect <laughs> that when when things are getting there was a lot of inflation in the construction market that there would be a tendency to try to capture that 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 lower initial cost that you get through design bid build. Um, but I'm curious is if, if Margaret has any sense or, or Danisco has any sense of, of communities um, pursuing the kind of net zero piece, but also because um, uh, the net zero piece is one thing that, that may tend to, tend to uh, suggest the CM approach. I also wonder if, if having the designer and the designer, the a construction manager in soon, you know, participating in the schematic part, and the um, schematic design and the and the as ongoing involvement through uh, construction drawings or construction documents, does that give us the ability to control cost in any way better? Um, you know, from kind of a from a practical perspective, uh, you know, we're in a we're in a construction market that is unusual. That is certainly outside of my personal experience and probably outside of the personal experience of, of all the all the folks who, who have that experience. Um, I don't know. It's just some of the things I'm thinking about. So, Margaret, I don't know whether you heard, but Jonathan has a hard stop. So I just was encouraging him to raise. Yeah. I mean, he's leaving us in about eight minutes or seven minutes. So um, so he had the, the two questions on. Um, did you hear both of his questions? Yeah, I didn't hear the first one. I heard the second one. I'm just curious if and I probably didn't articulate this very well, but um, do you have any sense of, of whether or not in that list of CM projects, there are those contained in the, any net zero schools? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Schools there? Oh yeah, there, there are several. Do we think yeah. anyone is currently trying to do net zero uh, design bid build? Um, I'm sure no. we will a, a, as an industry, as a, as a state, <laughs> um, but I, I don't, I'm curious if, are we going to be the trailblazer? <laughs> yeah, we will be the trailblazer. Okay. Um, Which actually, yeah, actually, I think I think during the so if we talk about net zero, right? I think I think maybe if we just step back a bit, what is it that's challenging or more complicated um, 
<coughs> with net zero than a tra traditional building that isn't trying to achieve net zero, right? Um, a lot of it is just making sure that your EUI is really low and that that's on the designer, right? Really more than anything else um, is making sure and, and the owner as far as usage, but that's on the designer, um, making sure that your EUI is really low. And then, and then really what's your path to achieving net zero? So for, for us, and I'll let Rick or Tim also chime in, for us, um, you know, having the PVs as part of the project. Um, but again, we, we can talk about whether it's, it will be part of the project, but, but do you bid that separately? Right. Um, yeah. I, there may be grants and, and other things that we may want to take advantage of and not do it through the GC or the CM. And then the other component really would be ge the geothermal aspect of it. Um, other than that, it, it truly is really incumbent upon the designer to make sure that the building has the right insulation and it has the right window wall ratio. It has like all of those things. So I don't know. I know Tim is on a building committee. Rick's on a building committee. I, I can say that um, the elementary school that I'm on the building committee for, it is designed bid build. Uh, there is geothermal. It is net zero ready. Uh, but they uh, are not going to own the PV. So uh, to take that money off of the project budget, um, they couldn't call it net zero. So all of the components are there and will be assembled, but it's not all under the contract, uh, but they're all there. And we're pretty confident that for that particular project, 149 is the way to go. So can I ask which project, is that project all new also? Is that on a... It's an all new building on a site with a pride with an existing school that is being demolished as an early bid package. Tim, um, who's the contractor? Uh, it has not been bid yet. It's Swamp Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, the, the Hadley School. So, you know, I think this is really interesting to me. I mean, I, I kind of I, I agree with Donna. Um, to me, the complexity is the geothermal, really. I, I, I mean, I think there, the issue of the EUI is it's in a design bid build situation, it's gonna put more um, pressure on the designer and our clerk to make sure that it is being, that the building envelope is being built, built correctly than you might have in a CM situation. But it's the geothermal piece, I think. And I, I don't, I think I, I have some approaches to how we would manage this. I'm, I'm not recommending um, CM. I don't think it's appropriate to recommend CM for this reason only. I just wanna make sure that you understand that that's where the complexity is. And that's what's different about this project is that there hasn't I, been. I'd like to add also though, but the geothermal component, <clears throat> much of it, in the equipment that's connected to it is a trade contract or a file sub bid anyway. Yeah. And the relative handful of geotechnical contractors that either a CM or a DBB general contractor would have to avail themselves to are relatively the same. So yeah, the project's complex, and frankly, there are CMs that do a poor job with complex projects, and there are um, general contractors that do a good job with complex projects. So it's it's kind of hard to pin one on a construction type. We've had <clears throat> I've had CMs do a great job all the way through with neat lead reporting and sustainability and others that approach it more like a general contractor used to. So it's really, so, and sometimes you can't tell until they're on, on the team and doing it. Yeah, agreed. Sean. Okay, Sean. Yeah, so one other reason why the previous building committee chose CM was MSBA offered additional reimbursement at that time. 
And then it, it seems like they don't do that anymore. And is there any insight why they stopped offering that? It was an extra per, uh, full percentage point, which again was sort of attractive to the committee and and made the you know offset the additional cost to some extent. Um, any idea why they pulled that out? Well, I think it was for two reasons. First of all, the MSBA doesn't they they would prefer that everything be designed bid build because they feel as though that is generally a lower contract price. Um, and I think also, um, as you could see, it's not, districts don't need it to have it as an incentive anymore. A lot of districts feel more comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. Committees feel more comfortable with it. So I think it was for both of those reasons. Yeah, I think just, just to add to that, um, CM, you know, just became enacted into law in 20, 2004. And there was a lot of conversation about really in the end, there's savings and it costs less because of contingent. Anyway, in the end, MSBA has said that they're not seeing the cost savings that everyone talked about based on their completed projects. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as Margaret said, that 1% was an incentive originally thinking that it was still gonna save money. But in the end, the, the answer is there really isn't there really isn't much savings or or any savings. And the change orders are the change orders. And I just I, I just want to really make that clear. So if there is an error omission on the contract documents, right? If there's scope missed on the contract documents, um, there is a change order. So it would be a change order whether it was hard bid or if it was CM. So I, I'm trying to think of a good scope item, um, you know, but if we miss something on the drawings, which we're not perfect, but the change order, if it wasn't on the drawings, mm -hmm. they, the contractor or CM is, is rightfully entitled <clears throat> to that additional money. A lot of times what we find with the CMs is even though it's on the drawing, <laughs> um, even, even if the scope is on the drawings, the CM will say, oh, well, we missed that. Oops, sorry. We're going to pull that from our CM <clears throat> contingency, where when it's a hard bid, we can go back to the contractor and say, nope, it's right mm -hmm. here. You own it. And they just have to pay for it. So- yeah. So there is a little difference. And, and, and just to build out that, and that's actually, I mean, that's the classic buyout CM contingency items, which are actually understandable. And I'm not saying this to, to try to torpedo CMR, but in my role on a building committee, I'm building committees with multiple CMR projects in my town. And also at Denisco, what I'm finding myself arguing more and more and what's a little more frustrating are the things that are on the drawings or in the specifications and you find out that during the cm's buyout the person they signed with uh deleted that from their scope so it's it's an item that in a in a hard bid if it's on the drawings and the specs you own it but if it's not then you're talking about well okay well they they said they weren't going to do that part. And we're, we're arguing about who's fixing the floor cracks before the file sub bid resilient floor guy comes in and, and puts his floor down. And the other thing that you, uh, CM contingency money, you know, my personal view is, okay, it's, it's the CM's money to spend as long as the owner agrees. You know, I, per, I personally think of it as it's the owner's money until they pay it out because the owner gets everything back that's not spent. Absolutely. And, yeah. And, you know, the other thing about CM contingency, I, I, I do think, and we've run into this recently with projects where there was like a lot of, you know, what's, I don't know what that game is with the, the, the cups and the ball and, and <laughs> the CM yeah. is kind of, they've kind of done this, like they took something out over here and forgot. And then it's like, oh, we want that out of CM contingency. We don't let them do that. Like 
you know, you own that, you buy it. But one thing that I think the CM contingency is really useful for is if you have to accelerate the project for some reason. And actually now that I'm, I'm back in the functioning, um, able to see you all and see everything else, I, I just want to um, sort of pull up this one slide and talk about this briefly. Uh, assuming that I don't screw this up again. Margaret, Mary had her hand up as well. Well, while she's pulling it up, I'll just mention. Yeah, Mary. Um, I agree with a lot of what Rick said. Um, I think either way we go, whether it's design build or CMR, the important thing is to have strict qualifications when we do the pre-qual of the contractors and the pilot subs. And then the only benefit that I've been seeing to CMR lately is the long lead times. We're able to buy the materials while we're still designing because you know lead times are just ridiculous right now yeah i think that um i totally agree you know one of the things that we're seeing is that um if you have a situation any of these situations where um there are things which are likely to impact the schedule for the project because stuff isn't available um or something needs to be accelerated, the CM process does provide flexibility for that because you can, they can buy stuff on their own and they can use the CM contingency to do, to accelerate the schedule, so. Yeah, um, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, a project in Springfield, the CM bought the steel deck because we had inkling that that was going to be a, a problem and he bought the deck and told the people that this steel erectors would normally carry that that they will be buying using this deck so right. at least we're on the list for the deck that said both our cmr and our dbb projects are all hamstrung with electrical switchgear delivery oh i know which is blind to the to the delivery method and the basic way out of that is to buy it under 30B, like we've done mm -hmm. with some generators, if it's a DBB project. So you could be hit with material delays both on both ways that you really I hate to say that COVID's given people a lot of cover. You, you really can't argue about. There's nothing you can do with. But having the flexibility to accelerate work because they built something into the budget that's a that's a is a benefit but once you commit to spending money on additional slab placement so they could accelerate a portion of the job and then the cm doesn't use doesn't take advantage of the of the thirty thousand dollars they spent for that and the stairs still don't come that's a little frustrating very yeah Yes, yeah, so, so basically um, that's a, a great option with 30B for the generators and things, but we have no idea of what's gonna be delayed next. Right now it's ductile iron pipe because all the pig iron comes from Poland. So you never know, it used to be, you knew the steel in the, in the switch gear. Now it's just a whole new ball game. Yeah, it's very unpredictable. So, so that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> stuff to go through. I, I hope that it answered some of the questions people have had about this. Um, I don't, Kathy, I, I don't know whether you want to take, I don't know if we've got a, do we still have a quorum? I think we have a quorum. I don't no, know whether you want, want to take a vote on this or move it till the next meeting. So we want to, um, I'll, I'll call a rule, but we're not going to take a vote on it, Margaret, because we're, we're in this, um, Oh, right. We're in a transition area on, on can we meet entirely, you know, so, um, and so, and we're missing some people, but I think um, if we, if people have time to think about it, to come in, um, my understanding is from CMR, we need to decide soon because of that long time, timeline, if we wanted to go CMR. So if we're going to do that, we got to make a decision on it. But I think people should, uh, members should come back having thought this through and Rupert's hand is up. We should all be asking any questions that we can think of right now to help yeah. inform that. So Rupert. 
Thank you. I'm, I apologize if I missed this. I had to take a phone call. Uh, in terms of complexity, um, the concern that I have is less the geothermal, though I understand that's got a lot of engineering involved, but just dealing with the site and the groundwater and the drainage strikes me as something that uh, has a lot of unknowns and a lot of complexity and may not be a, a, a filed sub bid. Um, do you have any comments? So I, you know, Donna and Rick, I, I think Amesbury, you said, had quite complicated site and is a design bid build. Is that right? Is that a good example to talk about? Sure. I think Amesbury, uh, Woburn, the Harold Wyman School as well, that was a hard, hard bid. Um, and both of those had early site packages. Um, it is our responsibility, whether it's DBB or, or CM, to have as much information as we possibly can on the site. So our recommendation on this regardless is to um, do a lot of testing. I, we, we recognize it's money, but it's money well spent to be able to have a better understanding of what's going on underneath the ground um, so that we can design to it and prepare for it. And a lot of times what we'll do is we will give a certain level of depth um, and say, okay, contractor, you're responsible for removing X amount of feet of dirt. And that would be regardless of CM or hard bid. Um, we sort of joke that we say it's, uh, it's really called CM at risk. And we, we tend to say it's CM at very little risk because they're going to say, well, it's what you told us to do. Um, and that's true because that, you know, we're, we're saying you own, you know, the dirt to 10 feet below and you're going to excavate it. And if it's um, hazardous material that you own it, if it's loam or, or soil that is not usable, you know, you need to plan for that. So it's, it's really what is, is as much information as we possibly can to know about in advance so that we can have a, as good of an understanding of the scope that's required. So the type of soil, how much needs to be removed, how far down do you need to go? And then how we can, can we reuse it? Does it have to be moved? So, again, so Donna, can yeah. I say this in a really abbreviated yeah. way? If you're gonna go design, bid, build, you want to invest the money in the site exploration before you go to bid. Yeah, I think we would recommend that um, regardless, especially on this site. And again, the more information we know, even if it's a CM, the more informed we are. So if you have a ceiling, I'm just gonna say a hundred million, you know, we need to know how much that site's gonna cost. It's not gonna help us for the CM to find out later if, if we have earmarked all of the contingency money, right? So um, it really is in everyone's best interest to do as much due diligence on the site as possible. Yeah, that's the nugget. Phoebe. So I see Phoebe's hand is up. Yeah, thanks. Um, off the topic that we're talking about, uh, but I just wanna try to get a little bit more clarity in my own mind. Um, so regardless of whether we go CM uh, or design bid build, um, if we if we think there's a possibility for other funding methods, i.e. grants or something like that, that piece comes out of the scope of work for the CM or for the DBB contractor? Was I correct in hearing you say that? No. Okay. No, the only thing I mentioned, Phoebe, would be for the offsite traffic. Yeah. Okay. I thought you had said that for the solar. All right. Oh, so no. that is still in there. Well, for the solar, if there are grants and it makes sense, we could we could do that as well. Um, so what we do need to do is explore all of the grants that are available and and you know, maximize those. And part of the conversation is with MSBA and what can the town use for third-party incentives or rebates 
that would not impact your share or MSBA share as part of the project. Okay, thank you. Allison, did you have something you wanted to say? No, I, it's just accidentally unmuted. Okay. Um, so I'm looking at the time. We have about 14 minutes left. Um, and a couple things we wanted to do. So um, we'll bring this back next at the next meeting, this issue to close the conversation. Um, the, we do need to pick a date for the school visits. And I had five folks participate in the doodle poll. So, it, and it looks like the three dates that work for the most of them are the 26th of July, the 27th and August 1st. I know that Mike had a preference for the 27th, but I also didn't see either Allison or um, Tammy participate. So um, Allison and Tammy, if we if it landed on the 27th, would, might you be able to join? I thought you, of all the folks, you might be the most interested in seeing other schools, or maybe you have other commitments. I just want to confirm. And, and um, Margaret, just so you had three dates are viable, 26, 27, and first on yeah. Mike. And so people remember we're, it's three schools and we figured out that we can see all three on the one day. And Paul at one point, and he can say whether this said we might be able to organize a van so it wouldn't be everyone having to drive out there by themselves or we can certainly carpool. So yeah. it's a question of the 26th, 27th and August 1st. Um, I guess what I would say is the 27th would probably be the best date. However, I'm in the midst of trying to see what I can move around for that. Allison, how about um, you? If we did, I, I know that August 1st would be the easiest, but that doesn't mean I couldn't make something else work. Okay. Okay, so let me, um, I think Mike was also good for the first. Tammy, with the, with the first? Yeah, I can't do the first. Can't do the first, okay. So then let's, let's go with the 27th. And um, if other folks who are on the committee want to join, we'll figure out what the capacity of the bus is, and we'll make we'll um, auction off seats. So, all right. Um, so, what is left? Leave wanting to leave room for public comment. I don't think we're going to get to the sustainability rating system today. But I do just want to pull up um, Danisco's most recent invoice, which we should look at and vote on. And um, then uh, we would have a few minutes for public comment. So here we go. Can everybody see this? I can. So I think it means that everyone can. OK. So I think um, just. Very quickly, so there the amount they're billing for it right is right here the 33335. Um, what that means is that this feasibility line item, which is getting us to the PSR, is complete. Um, and there's no other invoicing as part of this. So um, this is just a summary. This is where I sign, and then they also have a um, there's their, the summary invoice. So uh, that's it. It's kind of simple to look at. If someone wants to make a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, what month invoice, uh, the invoice, the- The June, thir June 30th invoice. The June 30th yes, invoice. Second. And so I need to, uh, Margaret, if you can take that down so I can see. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to do a roll call vote. Uh, Tammy? Yes. Sean? Yes. Rupert? Yes. Ben? Yes. Allison? Yes. Uh, Paul? Yes. Phoebe? Yes. Alicia? Yes. And Kathy is a yes. So it is unanimous with uh, three absent, Margaret, when you tallied the votes. Mm -hmm. Jonathan left early. Oh, four absent, sorry. I'll, I'll double check my numbers. So I, I just want to, I, I forgot to ask one question, Donna, when you said you do as much early as possible um, on exploration on the site. You are going to be, are, I'll ask as a question, are you going to be um, with the Conservation Commission going out and doing redoing the wetland mapping? Um, a flag, a flagging, whatever we, we call it. So to, and then, it, and with that, do you also, part of the, uh, the site design was moving a wetland, doing an exchange of, of <coughs> will that all be happening this summer? So that it's a kind of a question of, um, do we, at the point through schematic design, that would have to be signed off on before we could be saying, now we can build just the way you're planned. So just what's the timing on that? Yeah, well, um, the conservation commission process is, is long. And so the first part is to you know do um, an ANRAD, which really is determining the applicability of the scope. And so we'll be having initial conversations with them, making sure as we move along the process that um, they're in agreement that we, we understand what all the boundaries are, not just for wetlands, but also the, the flood prone area and, and all of that. Uh, Conservation Commission will typically not vote to approve our site design until much later in the process because they, we have to have our site designed enough for them to agree to. But in concept, we would be saying, okay, here's what we're thinking of doing. Are we in agreement, making sure that, that we have their buy-in before we get too far down the process? But they will issue an order, they'll approve the site and issue an order of conditions much later in the process, typically around 60% uh, CDs. But we, we do want their buy-in now to understand a lot of the initial assumptions that we're making and that they're in agreement with whether it's moving wetlands or, or replicating wetlands. And the purpose of the ANRAD, which is a ridiculous acronym for abbreviated notice of resource area delineation is basically just to get an agreement about where the boundary is. That's why you do it. So, so all the initial testing, Kathy, more um, would be, so we're gonna do that. There's gonna be a lot of activities that are going to occur simultaneously, um, but we definitely are gonna want to um, do a lot more geotechnical explorations and understanding the borings and, and all of that, um, understand the soils, understand the depths and all of that. And then the other thing is if we do go with a geothermal ground source, the other component there would be to get a test well in the ground as soon as possible as well. So, so that too would occur simultaneously. Okay. Thank you. I didn't, I just was, so that that's happening behind the scenes and you'll be bringing that information to us. Is Correct. Great. Okay. And we will, you know, when we do go before conservation commission, whether it's preliminary or otherwise, we do, you, you, um, the town or the building committee are the proponent. So you, you will be present at those meetings. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm looking, does anyone have any other comments, questions? Um, 
just uh, that to review that schedule, Sean has his hand up. We're meeting again in two weeks. That's the 29th of July. And um, you've got the tentative agenda in terms of pieces, but that is the first draft. So we will get be getting an agenda out. Sean? This, I mean, this can be till next time, unless it's a really short answer. But um, my recollection from uh, going for the lead certification was that there were some costs associated with it. And I'm just wondering if we're building a net zero uh, building and all the requirements that go along with our bylaw, um, does it still make sense to pursue the lead certification? Um, and if there's still additional reimbursement from MSBA for it? So when you say additional expense, first, let me just say whether it's lead or chips, which we didn't get to today, it is a requirement by MSBA. Yeah. And MSBA is expecting any project to at minimum be certified at, at one for one of those. Um, and to get the additional reimbursement from MSBA right now, all they ask is that your 20% energy savings over code. They don't care if you're certified or platinum, if I use LEED as an example, they don't care. They, they, their focus is more on energy conservation. Um, and as, as far as cost is concerned, the actual cost for you being LEED certified and then uh, for it to be verified is really not a lot of money as far as what, what you pay LEED or, or um, New England chips. It's uh, everything that goes into it, which is where the real cost is. Thank you. And Donna, there's it, it's a two percent we get by it, so it's real money, Sean. When you were asking yeah. that, that money is still in the MSBA formula. They yeah, no, I, and I get that. I'm, I'm. It seems like we're going beyond that. So again, that's um, yeah. where that question again, came from. Yeah, again, MSBA does not care if you're platinum or if you're certified, and as long as you achieve the energy savings, you get the two okay. percent. Because, and, and we'll get into the whole what what is lead really mean um some some projects just physically cannot get there because of the location of the site so yeah um it it it's there's more to it than than what seems intuitive believe okay. it or not okay so um i'm gonna if, if there are no other comments, I'm going to open it for public comments and and also to remind everyone that we will get a, a more a better understanding of what leads is, what tips is, and issues like daylighting that is on the agenda for two weeks from now. Um, so public comments. If anyone would like to make a comment, please raise your hand. I've brought uh, Maria to pick in. Okay. Thank you. A uh, quick question for Donna. Um, at the uh, net zero meeting, you had mentioned that there's this uh, up to even an eight week scheduling delay to do the test well, but um, I want to confirm that you are definitely planning on doing the test well for geothermal um, this summer, uh, regardless of any other decisions that, that is in the works. Um, and the other thing is to make a, a comment on uh, any meetings or subgroup meetings that might happen about design. I'd like to encourage uh, the committee to have all of those meetings open to members of the public. There's a lot of educators in town that don't teach at either Fort River or Wildwood um, and might not even teach at other um, uh, schools in our district, but teach elsewhere. And uh, there's a lot of other folks that might have ideas for design that could be valuable to hear. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, so I would like to encourage you to invite people in to share ideas and to give some reflections about things that you might choose to do with design and to make sure that you have a broad perspective available to you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, I have to get off to another meeting. Just okay, so I, I think I'm not seeing any other public comments. So I think we can adjourn the meeting at 
if um, I'm not seeing any hand, other hands up, just double checking with my new eyes um, that there are no hands up. I don't see any. So it is 10 o'clock. Um, as chair, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. And I want to remind people, I'll send everybody links, but all the net zero information that we've been seeing is posted and I'll send links to the full committee and we will be bringing that discussion on geothermal and air source, the HVAC, we have to make a decision. We'll be bringing it to the full committee. Um, so that we haven't got a recommendation yet, but we, we will. Um, so I wanna thank everyone and I wanna thank the guests, Mary and uh, uh, where where is he? He may have, oh, and Bob for joining us today. And thank you, Danisco team. I look forward to seeing everyone and to visiting schools. Bye. We are adjourned. <laughs>